stands elevated, building an altar where we stand. Where we stand in this presence of our Lord, with our hands elevated as a sign of surrenderance and humility, knowing that it is He who opposes the pride, but He gives grace to the humble. So with your hands elevated, with your hearts humbled, our Father, our God, we thank you for this day. We thank you, O oh God, for allowing us this opportunity to enter into this presence, to this your holy sanctuary. We pray, O oh God, that you would be pleased with the praise and the worship that we have given unto you on this day alone. We pray, O oh God, that your sanctuary in heaven would meet us all the more here in this earthly sanctuary. So God, we thank you and we bless you, knowing that you are the supreme ruler, you are the sovereign ruler, the savior that reigns. We thank you, O oh God, for reigning in the lives of these your people. So we stand now as your righteous seed. Pray, O oh God, that as your word comes forth tonight, that your Holy Spirit will rain upon our field. But Lord, don't let it rain upon our field until the seed has taken root on tonight. And yet, as the seed has taken root on tonight, O oh God, we pray that your Holy Spirit will rain upon our field and the harvest shall come forth. That shall bring you all the more the glory that is due unto you. We call out to every dead heart. And we say, come alive. Somebody say, come alive. We call out to every tribe home. And we say to that tribe home, come alive. Somebody say, come alive. We call out to every dead army that is lying in the ashes. And we say, rise up. And come alive. To refresh your pointing upon this, your servant, O God. And I may be all the more fit for this task. For so that not my will, but I will be done. Jesus name we pray in the heart said amen. 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 amen amen and amen as you remain standing I'll be standing longer than you come on and put your hands together and bless my Lord bless my Lord I truly the Lord and it's a blessed opportunity to come back home and it is so refreshing to see a man the solidarity that still exists still resonates, amen, out of the St. Paul community. And we bless the Lord for him establishing all the more of his presence with the giving of this pastor, the personality of the Honorable Right Reverend Michael G. from Sydney. Come on and bless the Lord. Thank you for his kindness as well as we bless the Lord for the St. Paul family. I don't want to start calling names, my eye might start leaking, uh, but yet I am overjoyed to see the Lord's grace and His faithfulness that still rests here in St. Paul. So good to see all of you, many of you, amen. Remember me way back when, amen, when I was a teenager on the drums, and yet I entered into ministry and transitioned to the fullness of manhood, amen. I got gray hair, no hair. Amen. And so this is Christopher Cabinets, for whom you all have sown many seeds. And it's so good to see Mama Card and Papa Card and so many of you, Mama and Papa Walker, uh, Brother Melvin, see I'm calling names, Barua, Melvin Jones, Amen, Sheila and Brooklyn, so many of you, Amen. And we're just grateful. Um, all the preachers of the house, if you would just wave at us on tonight, good to see my sisters and my brothers. The ministry and we acknowledge, amen, even our own minister, Arthur George, who's watching all the way from Birmingham, Alabama, so we acknowledge her. But come on and bless the Lord for new hope is in the house. As well as our very own Lady Cabinets is here. Come on and bless the Lord. Say preacher, and if you want to throw something up here at me, just make sure it don't knock me out. 
I want to call your attention very quickly to Psalm 34. And this is a familiar passage of scripture, but yet there is some insightful as well as divine revelation that the Lord will share with us on tonight. And I pray that you will be with us. Amen. And we bless the Lord for our musicians as well. And um, I hope y'all can work with me tonight because I can't hear up here, so I need you to work with me. All right. And amen. So they can't hear me either. So amen. We're going to make it easy tonight. But yet, the Word of God says, out the New King James Version of Psalm 34, verse 19 and 20 says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. Somebody say, but the Lord delivers them. But look at somebody and say, but the scripture says, the Lord delivers him out of them all. Verse 20 is key. He says, he guards all his bones, and not one of them are broken. Many are the affliction of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him from them all. And he says, and yet the Lord protects the bones of the righteous, not a bone is broken. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them from them all. He protects the bones of the righteous. Not a bone is broken. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him from them all. He protects the bones. He guards the bones of the righteous. Not a bone is broken. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him from the ball. He protects and guards the bones of the righteous, not a ball that's broken. I want to talk for a few moments from this subject, wounded but not broken. Say that with me, wounded but not broken. Look at someone and say, neighbor, you may be wounded, but thank God. Day and we begin to take this sermonic journey. I have you to know that it was well before the foundations of the world was ever established. Long before the womb was prepared for this great man by the name of David, whose mom, whose mother would bring him into the world through the carrying of her womb. It is the Lord who saw fit through his divine providential plan to allow himself who sits outside of the sphere in which he had called humanity to live in the earth. The Lord found himself creating a womb called the earth. The earth, amen, and many of us who know as called Mother Earth. And yet Mother Earth would become a womb, and out of the womb of Mother Earth, God would bring forth a man. His name is Adam. As he brings forth Adam, God had to then create another woman because he understood that in order for woman to come, she would have to come from the womb of a man. And yet the Lord prepared Adam to give birth to the woman, but yet the Lord saw fit in order for humanity to come forth in the earth and to be able to show the results of fruitfulness by way of multiplying and being reproductive, the Lord allowed the woman to be established as a woman. And I have you to know that all of us, even if you are male or female, all of us have been called to carry a woman. Because when you look at the womb, the womb for a child is not for the mother, but it is for the child. In other words, a womb is not for you, but it is designed to be carried or held for somebody else. That's a sermon within itself, because many of you need to understand that your life is not about you. But yet your life has to do with those in whom God has called you to. And yet the Lord, amen, understood in order for his redemptive plan 
to come forth and for there to be a sign of righteousness in the earth, he needed to establish a man who would be a man after his own heart. His name happens to be David, the one who found himself a man out in the shepherd field. While there in the shepherd's field, he has established himself not only as a worker of his father's field, but yet he is one who is looked upon as a worshiper. And it is a result of his work ethic as well as his desire to worship God, the Lord began to put him in training. That he would not only be limited to that of a worker and a worshiper, but he would now be defined as a warrior. And I came to tell you today that if you're going to work in God's venue and be a part of God's kingdom work, you must understand that your work is not limited to work alone. But in your work, a man has been designed to have a heart for God and because it is out of your worship for God. And the Lord will begin to show you how to strategically fight this thing called spiritual warfare. And yet here is David, somebody say David, who has now conquered the lion and the bear. He has now, amen, been anointed but not yet appointed. But yet through his appointment, amen, through his anointing, yet he has not yet been appointed to be king. Here is David found himself taking a stand against the Philistine nation. He conquers, amen, Goliath, amen, while through the giving of a stone, and the Bible shares with us that it was the releasing of a stone into the head of Goliath that, amen, Goliath was defeated, but yet it is the same David who has cut off the head of Goliath. And yet the Bible shares with us that David, amen, has experienced the singing and the proclamation that he has killed his ten thousands, but only Saul has been credited one thousand. And yet it is through this process David now finds himself knowing the true reality of life. And life will bring you to a place where you move from triumph to trouble. It is through Saul's jealousy that David finds himself now running into a coverted operation where he is now hiding in the shadows throughout, amen, Judea. He is hiding in the shadows of Israel, and here David flees to Ahimelech. He flees to Ahimelech, the priest, that there he's trying to find some sense of refuge. And yet while there he goes now where Saul would not dare go, knowing that Saul desired to take his life. David finds himself going now into Gath territory, Philistine territory. There we see him now under the rule of a kish. The Bible shares with us that David's plan backfires and David realizes he has made a terrible mistake. The Bible says unto us that when they discovered who David's true identity was, they were making plans, amen, to besiege him and overtake him. And yet David was afraid for his life and David begins to play crazy. He pretends to be a madman and he flees back, amen, to the hill country of Judea, southwest of Jerusalem. And while there he finds himself entering into a cave with his fellow soldiers. And yet while in this cave, the Bible shares with us that David begins to pen Psalm 34. What he says. While in this cave, he converts his cave, amen, not only from a place of refuge and safety from his external enemies, but now he begins to now have to look at his enemies under him. He's having to understand that this God that he has a heart for does not always give him the answers to all his questions. He realizes that this God will oftentimes put you in a cave only for you to discover that God will not always give you the solution to your problems. But yet the Lord will allow you to have a cave and experience so that he can bring you to a place of insight so that you can begin to discover how your heart sees God and how your hearts see you, but yet how your heart see the world around you. 
and yet here is David now in the cave and he converts this cave into a cathedral, a place of worship and praise and yet David begins to share in this song he goes from it being that of just a song alone to that being of a sermon. He moves from it being like that of a devotional to him sharing the doctrinal principles of how God rules and reigns. He shares in this song, he moves from grace, but yet he moves to God's government being established and his desire to have a relationship with his righteous. And yet David says, I will bless the Lord at all times. He said, I saw the Lord and he heard me. He delivered me. He is angels in camp. He says to them, fear the Lord. For if you fear the Lord, the Lord will meet all of your needs. He said, come and I will teach you his words. I will teach you how to walk with him. I will teach you how to do the work that God has called you to do. But yet while in this cave, David, a man says, in other words, I still don't know why it keeps let me go, but the Lord delivered me from my affliction. He takes a turn and he says, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them from them all. Or y'all don't talk to me tonight. He says many are the afflictions. David shows us a picture of his repression. David has been repressed. He has been restrained. He has been confined. He has been compressed, repressed, not to a place of depression. And he says, I have been afflicted. And when David says he has been afflicted, David says, I have been cast down. I have been struck. I have been pressed, I have been crushed, I have trouble in my mind, in my heart, in my body. This thing called life has brought me to a place of distress. And I don't know where I'm, whether I'm going or whether I'm coming. In other words, David is saying my affliction has been so great that I feel it resonating out of my physical body. I have moved from just being stressed. And now I have reached a place where I'm burned out. I'm sleeping, but I'm not resting. I'm sleeping, but my soul is tired. I get 10 to 12 hours of sleep, but yet when I wake up, my soul is tired. Am I going to talk to you tonight? Yes, I am. David says, here I am being afflicted. In other words, David is saying tonight, many of you are here tonight and you are going through your own momentary afflictions. And yet God says, here tonight, David is showing us that when you are afflicted, it simply means that you have been brought to a place where you feel cut off. From a dependent connection and your life has come to a place of no freedom. Is there anybody in here tonight who came through these doors who has experienced affliction? Have you ever had affliction to the point where you felt that you were disconnected and cut off from God? You didn't know where he was, but you knew you knew him. You didn't know how he was going to work things out in your life. And yet you quote all the scriptures you come in and you know all all the praise and worship songs but sometimes you come to church and you come to church to worship a God that you really wish you could believe in. See, this is a message for the real mature folk. Am I the only one that has ever came to church to worship a God that I really wish that I could believe in and yet my faith had been struck and I began to wonder is God going to say he loves me? But yet I feel a sense of loneliness. David is in a cave and he has a crowd all around him. But yet while in his cave with a crowd around him, he's still lonely. And I 
came to tell you that if any time you experience this thing called loneliness, I may help you to understand that loneliness speaks to the absence of identity. David is in a cave and he's all in a cave with all of these people, but yet he's lonely. Has there ever been anybody in here tonight who's ever experienced loneliness? And I want to tell you, your loneliness speaks to the absence of an identity. And here is David trying to find his identity in God. And yet David shows us some shabby news tonight because it's affliction. Can I just take my time? Can I just, can I just walk in slow? He shows us that any time that you have been afflicted, there's a blessing in disguise. But yet, if you're not careful, you'll miss it because David is in the cave and he's saying that I have come to a place where I am in a place of repression. But yet, David comes to a place where he is now reflecting. And out of his reflection, he realizes that my scars will become my badge. Came to bless somebody tonight to help you to understand that oftentimes we focus so much on the affliction and we miss how God has healed us and yet somebody in here tonight you got some scars but I want to help you to understand that those scars that you have from five years ago ten years ago fifteen years ago twenty years ago is your badge and your badge is designed to give you your identity. And if you are, have a sense of loneliness and you are feeling that you are absent from God, I came to tell you, just look at your scars. Because your scars will be your badge. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, do you have some scars? Well, tell them if you got some scars, you ought to be shouting tonight. Because when you look at your scars, your scar is what got to give you your identity. And when you look at anybody that's in law enforcement, anybody that's in the military, what do they have? They have a badge. They have a patch. They have something that identifies them not only just in their position, but also in their area of authority. And I came to tell you tonight that if you got some scars tonight, that's a sign that you have a mighty powerful authority on your life. a symbol of authority. So I need you to check your row and find out if there ain't anybody sitting on your row with some authority. And if somebody on your row don't act like they got some authority, you need to tell them you might need to go sit on the other side of the church. But come on, check your row and ask them, do you have some emotional scars? Do you have some mental scars? Do you have some spiritual scars? That's when you ought to come to church and shout because all the Seasoned by experience, 
you will begin to learn what not to worry about. I used to be slow to never roll the shot bus, but I have slow moments. I'm going to say it again. When your perception has been seasoned with experience, you will begin to learn what not to worry about. I'm going to say it again. When your perception has been seasoned by experience, you begin to learn what not to worry about. In other words, when you look at the word experience, you get several meanings out of the word experience. You get the prefix of the word experience, ex, which means to draw out, meaning to pull out. But yet you get the roots. Meaning of this word is where you get peril or testing. But yet God is saying tonight, it is your experience that you should not always just focus on what you've been through. But yet once you got out of the experience, and I believe that there's about 10 of y'all in the room that can say, Pastor Cabinets, my perception is constantly evolving because I've learned to not just focus on what I went through. Experience and there ain't anybody in the house that can testify. I done got a whole lot of wisdom, a whole lot of knowledge out of my experience. Is there anybody in here tonight that can testify? It is my experiences that has taught me how to trust God even when I can't trust. David comes from a place of repression. Reflection, and now he come to a place of recognition. I'm turning the corner, y'all. And now David is inspired. David is inspired because he's receiving insight on how he sees God. And then by doing so, David comes to a place of recognition. Somebody say recognition. Somebody say, I need to recognize. When you come to a place of recognition in your spiritual walk with God, in your spiritual relationship with God, watch this. Recognition, not by the standpoint of how we recognize man, but how you recognize God. Recognition simply means to accept the truth about a situation. It means to value and have an understanding of something or someone. And so David is saying, even though I cannot reciprocate what God did for me, I recognize if it had not been for God. That you feel like you're going crazy. 
Is there anybody in here that's ever felt like you were going crazy? You were about to have a nervous breakdown? David plays crazy because life is daring to make him crazy. And I came to tell you today that life is daring to make you and I crazy. And as a result of it doing so, you need to begin to understand that the enemy himself is after your mind. He's not after your brain. He's after your mind because your brain speaks to carnality. Your brain speaks to flesh. Your brain is the physical, but in your mind is the crown of your soul. The mind speaks to the supernatural, the invisible, and that which you cannot see. Satan wants your mind. So you got to ask yourself, are you going to do like David when you're wounded? Are you going to move to a place of daily renewal of mind? See, you walk around here shouting, talking about weeping man do it for a night, but joy comes in the morning. But yet God says tonight, you can have joy right now and eat today. All you got to do is change one thought. And you're weeping. Y'all ain't gonna talk to me. I didn't come to play with y'all tonight. I came for revival. You can change your thought one time. Your morning can come. But do you realize that by 2020, mental health, mental illness will be the second leading burden of health care? Do you realize that there are more people struggling with depression? More people struggling now more than ever with anxiety, panic attack. Y'all ain't talking to me. There are more people struggling, amen, in their mind. There are more people who are struggling in the area, amen, of chronic depression, complex trauma, anticipatory trauma, paranoia. And yet there are people who are walking around dressed up, but they're losing their mind. Just because you ain't standing outside talking to the stoplight or talking, amen, to the wall or talking to the tree and the fire hydrant don't mean there's a whole lot of folks that come to church, they look good, they got on three-piece suits, they got sew-in, $500 sew-in, they got stilettos on, they got heels, they got suits, they driving cars, they driving fancy cars, they living in fancy houses, and yet they're about to lose their mind. God told me to tell you. Don't be ashamed. Because all of us who were born into sin, all of us struggle with some form of mental illness. See, everybody don't like this kind of teaching and preaching. This is transparency. If you be honest, just because you may not be taking some form of medication to function, just because you may not be sitting on a couch talking to a therapist or a psychiatrist, all of us struggle with mental illness. You want to tell me, you want me to help you understand what mental illness really is? This is what mental illness is. It says, something happened in my life that changed how I view God and how I view life. Y'all ain't gonna talk to me. See, you, 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 you ain't got to just be a man, a man literally foaming at the mouth, but yet you must understand that all of us have had some experiences that has caused us to step back and wonder, God, why? Why did you do it? Why did you allow it to happen? And here you are trying to focus and understand that sometimes God will put you in a place and on a season to let you know I'm creating a wound. Because there's somebody that's going to need what you have on the inside of you. And I came to tell you, if you can overcome this season of your life, if you can overcome this test and come out with a testimony, God says you're going to give birth to some peace. You're going to give birth to a major healing. You're going to give birth to some sanity. You're going to give birth to some security. Because there are some people that you're going to encounter in the days and the weeks and the months and the years that's going to what God is birthing you with that he's going to call you to bring for you. So David says, I understand my righteousness in God. Not a bone is broken. He says, out of this righteousness that I have with God, he shows us a foreshadowing 
of prophecy that speaks to Jesus the Christ. Because he says, in me are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him. Notice he says, him. But then he says, them all. He has to say, him. Because if God does not deliver him, he can't deliver them. Him speaks to, oh, I feel the preaching here. Him speaks to the coming of sin. The Lord says tonight, he's going to deliver you. Because he delivered his righteous son. Not a bone is broken. He protects the, the bones of the righteous. Psalm 143 and 2 says, no one living is righteous before you. Psalm 14 and 1 says, there is none who does good. Ecclesiastes 7 and 20 says, Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. So who is he talking about? He's talking about Jesus the Christ. The righteousness of God. The one who has become the second Adam. Because the first Adam couldn't get it right. For there is no righteousness in you and I. But yet God, through his righteousness, through his divine plan of salvation, he saved you and I. He brought us into a right relationship with him, and he no longer looks at you and I and want to kill us. Because we are now the righteous seed of him. He understands, and we should understand, that this righteousness speaks of the truth of God. So now I'm no longer a hostile enemy of God. But now I have peace with God. Although I'm in the cave, as long as I got peace with God. As long as I can be in a cave, I can be about to pull my hair out. But as long as I got peace with God, I can receive the peace of God. And if I get the peace of God, I can have peace from God. But I can't have the peace of God. I can't have peace from God if I don't first have peace with God. Righteousness that speaks to the truth. What is the truth? The truth is in the bones. Somebody say the bones. The truth is in the bones. Why the bones? Because it is the bones in a physical, biological, uh, uh, anatomy approach. You will discover that the bones supports the skeleton. It is the framework of the body. It is the soft tissues that provide points of attachment for the skeletal muscles. Somebody say the bones. The bones offer protection, mechanical protection, amen, for the body, for it protects the internal organs, like the, 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 those parts of the brain. It is the critical bones that protect the brain. It is the vertebrae that protects the spinal cord. It is the rib cage that protects the heart and the lungs. It is the bone that assists us in our movement as they are attached to the skeletal muscles. It is the bone that store up minerals and releases into the blood. It is the bone that produces blood cells, red bone marrow, stores chemicals and energies that feeds into the red and blood cells and the white blood cells and, the, and all of these things that allow the bone, the body to have life. Watch this, the same way our bones help us physically, there are spiritual bones called the word of God. This righteousness speaks of the truth about the bones and the bones is the word of God. It is the foreshadowing of Jesus Christ because the Bible speaks of bones. Psalm 34, 20 says, he protects the bones, he guards the bones, and now a bone is broken. When you look at Genesis chapter number 2, Adam looks at Eve and says, she's my bone of bone. Flesh of flesh, meaning we are one. It represents our relationship, not only with one another, but also our relationship with God. When you look at Exodus chapter number 12, as God was making preparations to deliver his souls and people out of Egypt, he says, when you get the sacrifice, the first born, make sure that the bones are not broken. Make sure
perfection. It is not in a blemish form. In the act in Exodus chapter number 13, as they're coming out of Egypt, they have the bones of Joseph because Joseph said unto them, I may not live to come out of Egypt. I just believe God is going to deliver us, but just in case I don't live to see it, don't leave my bones in Egypt, but take my bones into the promised land. But yeah, the bones that they're carrying are not just average bones, but these bones speak to prophecy. These bones speak to protection. These bones speak to provision. These bones speak to the promises of God. Somebody say the bones. Second Kings 13, around verse number 21, there were some men headed out to bury a man, but yet they saw some raiders out in the field, and out of fear, they dropped the dead body on the grave of Elijah. And the Bible says that when the dead body hit the bones of Elijah, the dead body came alive. Y'all ain't gonna talk to me. In Exodus, amen, in Ezekiel chapter number 37, God tells Ezekiel, go down to the valley of dry bones. It's not meant for these bones to be dry and scattered and detached and disconnected, but he has speak to the bones. Because these bones represent relationship. It represents my righteousness. Speak to the bones and begin to prophesy. And the Bible shares with us even in Daniel chapter number 6 when those men who fought against Daniel and God delivered Daniel out of the lion's den, the Bible says those men that worked against Daniel, that plotted against him, that conspired against him, the Bible says when they were thrown into the den, the Bible says, watch this, and the lions crushed their bones. Why did they crush their bones? Because they did not represent the righteousness of God. But yet John speaks in John chapter number 19, around verse 31, that when Jesus was on the cross, I'm turning the corner, y'all. Jesus was on the cross. The Bible says, not a bone was broken. Why? Because God had the whole truth to his word. So look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, you may be wounded, but don't let the enemy fool you. You're not broken. You may have broken hearted moments and seasons, but even if you got the word of God, give me C major if you don't mind. Can you give me C major? Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, that, that, yes, Lord. Look, look at somebody. It's a neighbor. You may be wounded tonight, but thank the Lord that you're not broken. Because 